everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Yogi Aaron has a yoga retreat on the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. He's been an active yogi since he was 18, and today he talks about his path to greater wisdom and most of all to healing. Is there a secret to better health, especially as we age? The answer is yes. Come join us. Yogi Aaron, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell us your story. Well, thank you so much for having me here. My story is a long one, so I will I, I will abbreviate it. And please feel free to ask me, you know, jump in and ask me. I've been doing yoga since I was about 18 years old, and I got into yoga for the stretching. Um, I I felt like I was really tightening up, so that's kind of why I got into yoga was just to stay loose and limber. And as time went on, I started dealing uh, with a lot of chronic pain in my life. Um, I uh, had neck pain, lower back pain. So what did I do to solve that problem? (laughs) I did more yoga, (laughs) did more stretching. And, uh, you know, one of the things that yoga teachers would often say to me was like, Aaron, you need to stretch your hamstrings more. You need to stretch your back more. So I did. I got really proficient and became uh, a quote unquote flexible person. And so for the following 25 years, uh, it just was like this chronic, like pain cycle, get out of pain, fix myself sort of, and then continue on, stretch more, get into pain. And my journey kind of culminated um, 25 years later, I ended up in the emergency room of a hospital. Um, But preceding that was a year that was starting to um, grow in pain. I started um, having like even more intense sciatic pain, lower back pain. It became very uh, debilitating. The two months preceding that was like I could barely walk. And then I ended up in the emergency room of a hospital and an orthopedic surgeon telling me I was going to need a spinal fusion in my lower back. And that was, I mean, I've had a lot of bumps in the road, so I could talk about many stories of having bumps. But as you can imagine, when you're having a doctor telling you, you might need a spinal fusion, it's like, oh my God, I've been doing all of these things to kind of help me avoid this problem. And this, this doctor is, is telling me, Hey, you might need to have this. And that was, I've had a, there was a few light bulb moments uh, around that time, but that, that really hit me in the gut in a very unique way because I felt like it was challenging my identity and it was challenging me and who I thought I was as a person who I thought I, I identified with. And it was a moment of complete humility (laughs) and, and it challenged and invited me to kind of like step up and, and ask the question, okay, what don't I know? And um, I find you know, just kind of reflecting in my own journey. And of course, I'm a human observer, so I like to observe other people. What I kind of have noticed is that I, I'll, I'll speak in the first person, and, and, you know, from a place of accountability, I have always needed to feel like I know something because that something gives me a sense of self. And in that moment, I felt like I didn't know anything. So I had to go back to the drawing board. And, and so it was, it was a moment of humility, but it was also a moment where it was also empowering because it empowered me to ask that question, what don't I know? And from there, I was able to find a solution and you know, come out on the other side. That's a really profound moment. 
when a piece of uh, a significant piece of your identity is stripped away. Yeah. But I, <laughs> yes. I, I, I love, I love the fact that you said it's an opportunity. It's empowering. Talk yes. about that. Yeah. I mean, so I think, I think that we can kind of go two ways, you know, when something hits us, there's two ways. And I've been hit a lot in my life. Um, on it, I was, you know, I, I literally been hit. It was one time I was hit by a boulder in my leg. And so there's, I feel like there's kind of two ways that we can go. One way is like, I'm a victim, um, you know, life sucks, uh, you know, bad things always happen to me, or we can come out and we can say, okay, you know, how do I turn this around? One of my favorite expressions this last sort of year is like flip the script. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite ones is what can I learn? Yeah. What can I learn? Like, how can I get something out of this? And so I think part of what I was going through is like, how do I flip the script on this and turn this into an empowering part of my uh, story and journey? And part of that comes from having to ask that question, like, what don't I know? And so I just want to kind of put one more piece of the puzzle into there, which is a big lesson that one of my big teachers taught me many, many, many years ago. But it's, I think it's one of the biggest lessons that have stuck with me is like, if you're going to be a mess, be a happy mess. And <laughs> uh, that's kind of like how I managed to get on the other side of, of problems. Um, because problems happen to me just as much as they do anybody else. It's just our attitude and how we approach them. And so um, my teacher, Alan, taught me, well, if if something bad is happening or perceived something bad is happening, just laugh at it <laughs> and come back to the present. I like that idea of being a happy mess. I mean, it's so true. Yes. I mean, there you hit a point with some of these events where they, it is so out of your control. All you can do is just surrender, look at it, and you're right. You may as well be yeah. just be happy. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so much that's you. I mean, everything is. We're like a little speck of dust in this big universe of you know things happening. You know, we're on this spaceship traveling. You know, thousands of of miles every year, hundreds of thousands of miles every year. So you know, things are happening to us that are out of our control. And, and we're the only, you know, species that has the ability to make that choice of like, okay, how am I going to choose to respond to this? And, um, and, but that's also a very empowering place uh, to be. I find it really empowering to know I do have a choice. And, and that knowledge gives me a lot of personal power as I hit those bumps in the road. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what's interesting, too? The choice is not necessarily binary. I mean, we tend to no. think in those terms. The real A friend of mine once said to me, if you can't um, find more than three options, don't make, a, don't make a decision because you're thinking in black and white. And that mm. has been some of the wisest advice I've ever gotten. That's that's very uh, that's very powerful. Um, it's a very powerful paradigm to have. I like that. I might steal that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you got hit with this news about your back, how did you heal? Well, I got into that kind of. As I said earlier, I stepped back and I thought, "What don't I know?" You know, that was the big question, and so that question sort of lingered for a little while. And it led me into studying muscle activation technique, uh, which is a form of, well, muscle activation that was invented by Greg uh, Roscoff. And when I got into that course, I realized I didn't know much. You know, as, as a yoga person, I always kind of prided myself on thinking I understood the body and understood biomechanics a little bit. Um, when I got into that course, I realized I almost didn't know anything. <laughs> so that was very humbling, but it was also exciting because, you know, when I got into that course, I was around 45 at the time and it was like being back in school 
without having to be at school. You know, like so like all throughout my childhood, I hated school so much. I was never one of those kids that enjoyed uh school. You know, the idea of sitting down and listening to somebody uh mutter on for hours on end was extremely torturous to me. Um but here I was back in an environment of learning and I loved it. I I absolutely thrived in that environment and got so excited um, by it. And so I I love learning about the body. And one of the things that I got excited about was learning about how muscles work, which is something I didn't really understand before, which is ironic being a yoga teacher. Uh, but it, it empowered me to be able to start understanding how muscles work and what causes muscle tightness because I, again, got into yoga because I had tight muscles. So I understood the root causes of muscle tightness. But more than that, I also was able to start healing myself. Um, and as I healed myself and started feeling stronger uh, for the first time in my life, in my own body, uh, and when I say my life, since I would say since I started yoga when I was 18. So for the first time, I really had a, a strong connection to my body. Uh, I was also able to start helping others. And um, so my own sort of, you know, getting hit <laughs> with this bump in the road allowed me to created the platform, created the space for me to learn more about myself and in turn start helping other people. Are there some basic concepts to come out of this? That's a loaded question. Can you be a little bit more specific? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I was thinking, you know, uh, are there certain, does, does part of your learning focus on certain muscle groups that need to be improved? Um, and I'm always curious about the more um, spiritual, psychological aspects of yoga. But the, let's start with the tangible piece of that. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, yeah. And I mean, what I started to learn is that most of us, uh, and I will again, talk in first person, I was walking around with my major muscles, just never working. And so a lot of people, you know, know that they're inherently weak in some muscles. And so I'm, just, I'm talking, of course, in broad strokes, I'm, I'm in, in general terms right now. But a lot of us understand like, hey, I need to get, let's just say a strong core. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our core is weak. And we kind of know that our core muscles have to support our back. So our solution then is, okay, I'm going to go do Jane Fonda's ab workout. <laughs> and that's going <laughs> to magically get me a stronger core. And so what I learned is, that necessarily isn't the solution because the problem is that our muscles just aren't activated. And so one of the cool things about in muscle activation we learn is like there's literally a light switch in the muscles. They either are on or they're off. And so what muscle activation does is it starts to turn muscles on. And so going to your question, yeah, we want to start looking at some of the major muscles and start getting that light switch turned on. And this is kind of a bit of a woo-woo spiritual side of it too, because in yoga, one of the things that we learn is less is more. And uh, and we see this, There's a, there, I could get really deep into the philosophy, but I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. There's one of the philosophies of practicing becoming effortless, and mm -hmm. it's, it's flies in the antithesis, especially for me. Cause you know, for most of my life, a type personality kind of person, um, you know, push it to the extreme. And so for me to kind of like learn to loosen the effort of my actions, uh, while still having strong intentions, so it doesn't mean that the intention wavers it just means that the effort isn't as much. And so part of this journey has been to loosen that effort and to become more effortless and, and know that the more subtle I am, sometimes the more stronger the impact. So that's also part of it as well. No, the less is more philosophy is interesting. It seems to me yeah. that first you have to be fairly fit before you can get to the less is more place. 
Um, no, not necessarily. I last week I just taught a muscle activation retreat, and I would say that most of the people attending were like fifty five and up. And there was a couple of people that were younger than that, but most of them were like fifty five and up. And what I have found is, and and a lot of those people are not you know, in shape, like when I say in shape, you know, we look at the archetypical person that <clears throat> is fit and, you know, has, has a certain decorum or level of fitness. And so when you're working with people like that, one of the things that you have to realize is like the, part of their, I'm going to use this word disability in body comes from, you know, past injuries, past stress, past overuse. And so biomechanically, they've started to tighten up. And a lot of that is the result of stress. And the result of stress is inflammation. Uh, So the last thing you want to do if you are, I'm going to use this word out of shape, is to push hard, because you're just going to create more stress. And then that stress creates more inflammation. So we want to move into this space incrementally, slowly, methodically, um, and start turning on, again, the light switch idea and the muscles, start turning on those muscles so they start working uh, properly. So in the muscle activation sphere, you know, when we're working with turning on muscles, we're working on simple isometrics. And, you know, when we do isometric holds, and this kind of sums up a little bit of the less is more. When we're doing isometrics, I, a lot of times I'll say 10% effort, you know, just 10% effort. And so that's one. And then two, uh, we just hold these isometrics for like six seconds. And then we repeat them six times. So it's not a lot. And a lot of people always ask about, well, why six, six, you know, why six seconds, six times. And well, if you start holding it longer than six seconds, you end up running the risk of causing too much stress to the system. So six seconds is sort of a good number. And then six times is to reinforce that new uh, muscle patterning, patterning so that the muscle starts working properly. And you can target this to do fairly well to different muscle groups. Absolutely. So like, you know, a lot of people are busy doing like a lot of abs. So we just talked about core before. And so a lot of people think, well, I have a weak core, so I need to start doing a lot more sit-ups. And that's actually the wrong thing to do. Um, The best thing to do is to start doing something so you start turning on those muscles. And one of the things, you know, one of the things to kind of think about is if I'm going through life, you know, I'm bending over, picking up stuff, I'm going shopping, I'm pushing the shopping cart, whatever. If I'm going and doing all those things without my abdominal muscles working, without them actually turned on, then other muscles start getting stressed out. But here's the thing. If you start doing some muscle activation, for example, to get those muscles turned on before you're doing your activities, then while you're doing those activities with these muscles turned on, they actually get stronger, which is a really cool thing. So if you start out strong, meaning that the muscles are turned on, then you actually get stronger uh, as you're going through life. And you don't need to do all those sit-ups because you're going into those activities with a whole body that's actually working. So um, kind of like hitting the gym and trying to do all these workouts. Yes, there's some definitely some good arguments to be made about working out. I work out, I, you know, I do things to keep myself physically active, but I always spend about a good half an hour before my workouts, um, doing my muscle activations and starting to do things to make sure that, that my muscles are working properly. Okay. I'm about to go off on a tangent. Okay. And it may be a dead end, but bear with me. Um, sure. One of the things, you know, in terms of as we go through life, we get slammed by all sorts of things. And to there's a lot of research showing that that um, those encounters, those negative encounters stay in our body. They're in our muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Um, The idea of being able to activate a specific muscle group 
is kind of intriguing from, intriguing from a psychological perspective. Could you use that to actually release past trauma? Okay. <laughs> I told you it was so, a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I might say something that might kind of some of your listeners might get upset about. So, oh, go for it. it go for it. It's it's important. To, so, this idea of like our muscles holding trauma is a little bit of pseudoscience, and mm-hmm. um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like a lot of times, you'll hear yoga teachers say things like, "We hold emotions in our hips." That's not really true. I mean, it's just there's no science to show that. There's just nothing, you know, to to show that. So this idea of us holding emotions in our in our muscles, there's not a lot of evidence to show that. Now, there's a but to that. <laughs> so the but is this, and I'm going to kind of answer the but in two different ways. So the first way is if we're stressed. And, and the stress could be because of past traumas, okay? If we're stressed, and, and usually if we have a past trauma, and again, I'm kind of speaking generally, but if we have a past trauma, we might get triggered uh, mm-hmm. or, or, you know, another word to use that I actually prefer is our buttons are pushed, <laughs> our mental buttons, <laughs> then, you know, that can create some stress, And so the byproduct of stress is inflammation. And that's never a good thing to, you know, our body releases all of this, these, you know, these hormones and cortisol. And, and of course, inflammation is one of the byproducts of stress. So that's never a good thing. And that's going to debilitate muscle function. That's going to debilitate Um, our ability for our central nervous system to connect to our body as a, as a whole. So if that happens, the result is always going to be muscle tightness. So that might be where people are starting to experience, you know, like there's a visceral response possibly. Um, Another way of also looking at this is, is that possibly there's some trauma that exists and it, it, comes and it shows up in our nervous system. Again, you know, that whole sort of fight or flight parasympathetic mm-hmm. response. And so that could possibly be where it also shows up. And again, that's going to cause problems physiologically. Uh, we know like, and I've had this experience, I'm sure that you have as well as your listeners mm-hmm. where maybe you're having a good day and then you know, lunch is coming up or dinner and you're so hungry and you're like so excited about eating. And then you get into a fight with somebody or an argument, or, uh, as it's happened to me a few times, an email lands in your inbox. That's (laughs) not bringing good news. All of a sudden you lose your appetite because again, stress. So stress is a, it plays such a role in it. And what I would encourage people to do instead of focusing on releasing trauma in your hips or <laughs> in your body is learn to relax. Um, there's been, uh, you know, in the yoga sciences, we have an incredible practice called yoga nidra. And yoga nidra is basically, for lack of going into a deep explanation, is basically learning how to relax. So much emphasis is put on sleep and, you know, the need to sleep for eight hours a day. And well, while people are getting their eight to 10 hours of sleep a day, a lot of people are waking up not rested. And so yoga nidra is the answer to that. And one of the things that I find interesting in doing some yoga nidra research and in some of the other kind of research into the yogic relaxations is how beneficial they are for people that are suffering from PTSD, for example. Uh, And so learning to, or I'm going to say, I'm going to cut out the learning part, creating space in our life to really genuinely relax and rest is so important. And I would say that that plays a huge and important role in sort of our own healing evolution process. And uh, instead of people actively trying to release their hips, <laughs> for example. <laughs> do, do you have a daily ritual of some sort um, that you use to k- get into a, a good place? 
Well, the first step is waking up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I wake up and I have my little rituals. I have my, I take an internal shower every morning. Um, I use that space to kind of sit and what is my day going to be like? How am I going to live my purpose today? Um, that's really important. I, I, something I, I come back to a lot in my life is asking that question. How am I living my best life today? You know, um, and, and it can be in any situation. Maybe I've got a ton of, of work to do, like emails and, and video editing and, you know, whatever, uh, curriculum planning. Or maybe I'm in Italy in the Mediterranean. But the question is always the same. How can I live my best life today? And how can I live in purpose? And part of that is a few things. But one of them is, for me, living in purpose means a few things. But one of them means how can I do my duty? How can I be the best version of myself uh, today? So that's kind of one of the things I do. I take an internal shower every morning. So I make sure I drink about half a liter to a liter of water every morning. Um, I have my coffee ritual in the morning. So I'm down to about one cup of coffee usually a day. And that's usually in the morning after I've had my internal shower. Uh, and then I have some quiet space again, just to contemplate, uh, do my muscle activation practices. So I'm strong for the day. And the other thing I do at night, and one of these is kind of a new and recent ritual that I started about four months ago. Uh, but I start to quiet down and there's a conscious moment when I turn my phone off and that's the new ritual I've been doing very consciously. Not only do I turn my phone off. I leave it in another uh, room in the house and I don't have it beside my bed. And so I have that space between turning my phone off to going to sleep or, or going to rest where my brain starts to disconnect literally from everything else. So I can just start to focus on me. It's interesting you say that. Um, I'm very aware of electronics in my life. And there mm. are certainly very some very good aspects to it. But it is mm-hmm. way too easy to get sucked in to the, and sucked down these rabbit holes where your attention span just goes to zero. And yeah. one of the things I do is I make I read at, uh, probably on average about two books a week. And I do it not only because I'd love to read and I have guests who have books and things like that. But I do it because I want to work my concentration and focus, and I want to hold on to that and maintain that ability to go deep, which I think you really lose if you spend too much time online. Or at least I'll say, I know I lose it if I spend too much time going down rabbit holes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was actually just interviewing a gentleman recently who... um, um, when I was interviewing him for him, he was in a different time zone. It was nighttime and his, he had this red light you know, shining on him. It was very wild. And so we got into this whole discussion about that. And so he was like, yeah, this is part of my nighttime ritual to have red light on me. And it, you know, he started going into the whole, um, science of it and how, you know, your body starts to release certain hormones and that sort of thing. But the point of that was that he was just mentioning how a lot of our devices have what's referred to as blue screens and that, you know, creates a cycle of addiction within us. So as you know, for your listeners who I'm going to just assume that they're kind of awakened people, um, maybe not enlightened, but awakening <laughs> like me, um, that, you know, it's, it's just becoming aware of that. And I'm completely aware of when I'm too much spending too much time on my device, it gets harder and harder for me to turn that device off and close it. Um, and so I really have to be very conscious and awakened to this fact and, you know, create that space where I turn it off. Actually, one of the other habits, I'll just throw this into the mix that I've been doing recently as well. And I started this about two months ago, three months ago, is when I go to the gym, normally I bring my gym in, my my device in so I can listen to podcasts. I guess this isn't a good commercial spot for you right now. <laughs> but anyways, I, I actually have been stopped bringing my phone in with me, even just to listen to podcasts. 
because I find like when I have that other thing and I'm, I'm working out that it distracts me. And so creating that space where I'm not distracted and I'm allowing my attention to be completely on what I'm doing, it resets me in a very potent way. Uh, it's, it's, it's just potent. So I, I would encourage anybody to try that out. Um, and, and just kind of look at where we have our devices as crutches for sure. Now you have a yoga retreat in Costa Rica. Is that correct? That is correct. On the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Where can people find you? So the name of the retreat um, is blueosa.com. Blue is the color blue and then osa is osa.com. And we're located in the southern part of Costa Rica on the Pacific side. Uh, it's a magical place. Uh, and I, I'm not being glip when I say that. It sits in one of the most prestigious rainforests in the world called the Corcovado National Park. Uh, National Ge- Geographic said that 2.5% of the Earth's biodiversity exists in this one like small location. And that's where we are. Um, and so that's where people can come if they want to come and join us on a retreat or just come as a guest. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll support this podcast by becoming a Bump2 subscriber. Buy us a cup of coffee. It's your support that makes this podcast and website possible. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life.